So Jesus' gift is to open these things up to us. Jesus is the one who gives the ability, cracks things open with these amazing questions and, and wisdom, and gives us the opportunity to say, wow, in the light of what he has done and said, who am I? Hello, and welcome to More Than Sunday, a weekly podcast where we take a deeper dive into the stories, themes, and questions of our faith. My name is Eric Chikowski. I'm the worship director for Access, our modern worship community at First United Methodist Church Richardson. And with me every week is our lead pastor, Julie Richter. Hey, how's it going, Eric? I'm awesome. How are you? I'm incredible. Oh, you're incredible. Yeah, it really has been an incredible week. We've been in this sermon series called Be Incredible, which has been based around spiritual gifts, but also based around the new Pixar movie that just came out recently, Incredibles 2. And I was so excited to see it. And we actually took a group of us from the church on Sunday, and we got to finally see it. Do you know the sequel took 14 years? I heard one of the chief storytellers from Pixar talk at a conference about how even though we wouldn't necessarily think it because they have so many sequels, they're trying to be more creative and to sort of steer clear of sequels because they want to reinvent the wheel. It's sort of a a practice of theirs. Mm. And so it doesn't surprise me that it took a while, but what a fun afternoon and and what a great movie. We won't won't spoil anything for anybody. Right, yeah. No spoilers today, but man, it was good. Yeah, for sure. It definitely delivered. That's right. So as part of the last week of this series, Be Incredible, we're talking about knowledge, wisdom, and discernment today, and we have a great guest on the podcast with John Thornburg today. John is someone who is just incredibly wise and does a lot of work around discernment, and we're thrilled to be talking to him today. Well, we are here with Reverend John Thornburg. John is the Vice President for Area Staff at Texas Methodist Foundation, a walk-alongside organization to primarily the Methodist Church. And John is extremely gifted and experienced in the work of discernment and just an incredibly wise person. And I have to share just a little story really quick. John and I have done some work, and John's been a mentor for me over the years. And a circle that I run in affectionately calls him OB John. Uh, Yes. And so we are... (laughs) Thrilled to have John Thornburg with us. Thanks for being here today. It's a blessing. So, John, would you tell us just a little bit about sort of your professional journey and what led you to where you are today? Well, I'm a fourth generation Methodist preacher, and I come from a family that couldn't decide whether we were singers or preachers. So we, <laughs> just, so we decided to be both. Excellent. That's great. And there was a point, interestingly, that I did have to discern whether I had a call of my own or whether I was simply doing ministry because it's the only thing I'd ever seen. Family business. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And I'm delighted to tell you that I did discern that the call was not my dad's but my own. From there, I think I'd say that I had two really distinct turns in my calling uh, because I had several years in parish ministry, and then felt a call to the ministry of congregational singing. This was 12 years on the road helping congregations regain their singing voice. Mm -hmm. Then discerned a call to be an entrepreneur of hope with TMF. And, And so each of those turns involved asking the question, God, what are you doing here? What are you asking of me Or, God, is this you saying this? So, John, we are in this sermon series called Be Incredible, where we are talking about spiritual gifts. And some of those that we are talking about this week are discernment and wisdom. So can you help us to define what wisdom and discernment are? Well, I would say that discernment is the disciplined observation of what's going on inside us and around us with a view to obtaining spiritual direction. So it's not just listening for what's going on, but asking, God, what are you doing now, and what's the effect going to be on me? And wisdom is (laughs) 
is that wonderful gift of knowing that if you can't figure out the difference between planning and discernment, you're going to get in trouble. Mm. <laughs> yeah. so, we, we plan our lives, you know. We say, okay, what do we do next? But discernment is all different because it's, God, what are you asking of me? Yeah. So how does discernment look different individually versus in a corporate setting or a group setting? Well, let me tell a story. In 2005, I was four years into this ministry of congregational song, and I realized that almost every engagement I had were with people just like me. Hmm. My color, my level of education, my level of income, something like that. And it's not like I didn't like those people. I just found myself in morning prayer saying, God, if it be your will, could you make my life a little more colorful? Hmm. Hmm. And I am not making this up. Ten days later, I got an email from Wes Magruder, who was at that time Methodism's missionary in Cameroon. And he said that they were doing a big piece of discernment in Cameroon about what kind of church they were called to be. And did I know, he was sneaky, he said, did I know of anyone <laughs> who might come and help them develop their first hymnal and worship book? And then uh, the email had a PS. It said, and we'll need a fool because I have no money for this. Mm. <laughs> and I just read this and I felt an overwhelming sense that something big was going on. Mm. And I walked into the living room where my wife was and I said, Beth, I think I'm being called to be a fool. Mm. It's those kind of moments when for reasons unknown to us but only to God that God's will and our hearts meet at an amazing place. And I was looking for a different experience, a deeper level of life, a deeper level of engagement with God's people. And God was so instant in my prayer request there. It was, it was amazing. Now, in terms of group discernment, wow, this is big stuff. <laughs> Because in group discernment, what we're trying to do is get a hold of what our story is, what our common story is. So in a congregational context, we're asking, who are we really? Hmm. You know, we've got our public witness that says, we're a church that has this many members and we worship at this time, we have this many Sunday school classes. But then there's the private witness that says, we're a congregation that does these things well and stumbles on these things, and we have historic patterns, that some of which help us and some hurt. And so it's, it's that amazing moment when a group of people are willing to say, we have to engage the church's private witness, get real about who we are, and get equally real about who God is sending us to. And... I've had some recent experiences of courageous people that did that vulnerable thing of saying, wow, this is who we really are. God, it's going to take us a while to get to the place we want to get to. We really want to walk alongside you. But I tell you, the moment at which a whole table full of people feel something at the same time, uh, technically, I call it strategic intuition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody at this table realizes something all at the same time. Mm. Wow. The word that keeps coming to my mind that I had not really connected fully with discernment is vision. That what God's calling us to do is to open our eyes and first open our eyes inward so that we can see a fuller picture. But until we really look inside, how can we see that bigger and better picture that God is really calling us to. And that's really beautiful when we're able to do that together. That's so true, Julie. That's so true. And, you know, when we get the real picture of ourselves, because God is as good as God is, when we get the real picture, it doesn't. Well, maybe there's a little sting in it. You know, we say, oh, gosh, I wish I were different. But because God is as loving as God is, when we get the real picture, then, then we got a place to go. Because mm. then the next question is, God, what are, what are you asking of me now? I've, I've done the deep dive. At least I'm trying to. And maybe I'm a little more ready to hear what God is asking of me. Yeah. 
So along those lines of what God is asking of us, how did Jesus specifically model discernment or wisdom or, or both? Let me approach it from the standpoint of someone who Jesus met. I think of the story in John chapter 5 where there is a number of people beside a pool that's said to have healing properties. There's one who's been there longer than everyone else. The Bible says he's been there 38 years. And he has every excuse in the world for why he hasn't gone down into the healing waters. And Jesus asks one of the most astonishing questions in the whole Bible because it's so wonderfully direct. Do you want to be healed? And so where I want to rest is in the millisecond after Jesus asks the question, when, when the man beside the pool has to start formulating an answer. And then I wonder, what was his question before Jesus arrived? Hmm. And I think the question of that man before Jesus arrived was, am I alive or dead? Yeah. And so Jesus' gift <laughs> is to open these things up to us, is to say these extraordinary things that crack open the narrow places in our lives. No one can serve two masters. Uh-oh, I got a decision to make. Mm -hmm. um, don't be anxious. Uh-oh. Caffeine's the only thing that gets me up in the morning. What do you mean, don't be anxious? <laughs> so I think that Jesus is the one who gives the ability, cracks things open with these amazing questions and, and wisdom, and gives us the opportunity to say, wow, in the light of what he has done and said, who am I? So you've touched on it a little bit, John, and I think we can go a little bit further with it. One of the other words that we are talking about in the spiritual gifts is knowledge. So do you see a connection between knowledge and discernment and wisdom? Yes. You know, these days with the explosion of the Internet, there's this saying, data is not knowledge. Knowledge is not wisdom. I really believe that, but let's look. Knowledge is stuff that we learn that may be serviceable, but wisdom is the result of being burnished, <laughs> having our rough edges polished off, mm -hmm. having the experiences of life of knowing who we've hurt and how we can apologize. And so I think it goes in that order, data, knowledge, wisdom. Like knowledge is the step before wisdom. Yes. Mm. Yes. I like that. Hmm. One of the greatest reasons that we were so excited to talk with you specifically about this piece is the work that you do discerning God's call for churches. Would you talk just a little bit about that work that you do? I will. I always say to a team that I work with that it's wonderful that the cross is our prominent symbol because I hold up one of my arms vertically and I say, this is the capacity of the congregation to make a difference. And I hold my other arm in the perpendicular position and say, this is the community's need for transformation. And discernment is finding the intersection of those two things. So on the one hand, it's the deep dive that a team of people need to make to say, who are we really? How can we find what's truly distinctive about who we are? What are people here good at? And then to ask... Who is around us? What do we know about our community? What do we know about ourselves and having those go together? Now, the most exciting thing that happens in this is if a group of people are vulnerable enough to name the big stuff. I was with a congregation not long ago that's aging, and in that congregation, not wittingly or maliciously, the vision is being held by the older adults. So the younger adults are asking, how can we get in? How mm. can we do this together? We feel as though somehow the vision of the church is being held hostage. Mm. And this is a difficult conversation. It's an important one. It's an amazing one. And so 
one of the persons at the table said, well, if we look at our historic pattern, what we're really looking at is that we have two choices, deep change or slow death. Hmm. Now, the table was pretty quiet at that point, but not the quiet that says, oh, let's stop this. This is awful. We shouldn't be here. It was the quiet of recognition. And then someone said, well, John, I wonder whether the discernment we're called to do is not the choice of deep change or slow death, but whether we have the courage and the capacity to choose deep change. Hmm. And that was a courageous thing to say. But there was, there was something even a layer deeper that was going on. The church had a history that two different times in its 55 years, the congregation had come right up to the edge of making a decision to relocate. And both times the decision had blown up and there had been a lot of conflict. And so in this room a couple of weeks ago, someone just said, well, I wonder whether what we were supposed to learn all along was that this is the neighborhood God is sending us to, the one we tried twice to escape. Hmm. And this was very courageous work that that team was doing. I, I couldn't have been more thrilled to be in that room. I mean, tough stuff going on, hard stuff, yeah. hard choices, mm. but courageous people. That's, that's discernment. Well, and it does take courage, absolutely, for where our denomination is right now and where many of our churches are, there is so much fear around dying. The constant conversation about declining numbers and where are all the young people and what are we going to do about this? And so in your work with churches and where you see our denomination at at this point in time, what's the discernment that you've done around what our better future looks like? Well, the mission of TMF is to help the church in the achievement of its God-appointed mission. That's our mission statement. And so what we're attempting to focus on is simply in the midst of this anxiety, God is still as good as God has ever been. Mm. That means that God is doing what God has always done. That is undergirding us, giving us courage, showing us wisdom showing us a way where we think there is no way. And so I suppose our work now is to be entrepreneurs of hope. That is to say God is as good as God has ever been. And while it is true that the denomination is having a very hard time finding unity, God is not walking away, throwing up God's hands. God is still in the middle of it, calling us to acts of courage and faith. And so I end up having the hope that no matter what happens to the denomination, we will have a newfound commitment to our basic purpose. So that's what we're trying to work on. Those are such important words for churches to hear, for congregations to hear, for people to hear in the midst of any kind of uncertainty, just to be reminded that hope still exists and that God is steadfast, that God is not changing in the midst of those things. John, we obviously have such a respect for your wisdom and your knowledge and for the work that you do. Do you remember a specific time where a teacher in your life shared wisdom that really made an impact on your life? I remember my first day in seminary when the professor of worship and preaching, Grady Harden, stood at the front of Perkins Chapel and with a warm smile on his face and his arms extended out in hospitality, preached a sermon called, You Have the Run of the Place, in which he said, we're so delighted that you've discerned God's call in your life that you've ended up here. We know that there may be some things that are really frightening to you right now, Maybe every impulse tells you to head to the back door <laughs> uh, right now. And I said, here is a man who is wise enough to see into the hearts of the people to whom he's speaking. And it had a profound effect on me. It was just the gentle honesty 
that said, I can imagine you are feeling some of these things, and if that's true for you, here is my word. It had an extraordinary effect on me. Mm. What a beautiful example also of wisdom gained that isn't necessarily uh, very often from a textbook or a formula. The wisdom that you felt like you gained was a sense of peace, a sense of knowing, and really a, a lesson in seeing into the hearts of people, which is generally not something that we can read out of a textbook. Mm -hmm. But speaking of textbooks, I have another question for you. As we were talking about wisdom and knowledge and discernment, are there biblical characters that you can think of that as you read those stories beyond Jesus, obviously Jesus <laughs> is, is, is the great wise teacher, that you think of that you read and say, gosh, that person had a lot of wisdom? Well, I think I would talk especially about that group of people who shared their raw and unedited experience, and we call those the Psalms. Mm. They have the everyday wisdom of watching. Now, they are very raw, and thank God those who created the Old Testament canon did not look at some of the Psalms and say, oh, these are too depressing, let's leave them out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there is such wisdom to be gained by simply accepting the Psalms for what they are. And so I look to the Psalmists as people who were really attentive to their own being, and that helps me. Well, John, we have a question that we ask every guest that we have on the podcast and doesn't have to be on this topic at all. But our question is, at this point in your life, what's one thing that you wish somebody would have told you? Well, I wish somebody had told me when I was 20 that I should moisturize every day. So, <laughs> you know, That's so that the best I, answer we've had in a I while. I think so, yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, I just wanted to keep my, you know, my boyish appearance. But, um, <laughs> but You've done well. Um, yeah. But there is, there is one that, that my wife reminded me I talk about often, and that is, in my pastoral life, I have a case of conflict aversion. And so one of the ways that showed up was that I was skittish about asking for major gifts for mm -hmm. projects in the church. And it came time in the 90s in the church I was serving to do a capital campaign. And, and I remember going to a potential donor, shaking inside and making the pitch and watching as the person rose from her seat and said, just a minute, came back with a check for a very generous amount and handed it to me and said, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be generous. Mm. And now I wish I had heard those words a lot earlier in my pastoral life because it was that wake-up call for me that it isn't about the institution's need to receive, it's about the giver's need to give. It was an area of my life that I needed a jolt in, and that wonderful woman was God's agent for the piece of discernment I needed, and I thank God for her. Well, John, we thank God for you. We have just been a sponge today, soaking <laughs> up so much wisdom that you are offering not only to us, but to so many of our churches and, of course, to our listeners today. And so thank you for your work around discernment and wisdom and for the hope that you offer to us and to our church and to churches around our area. You're a blessing. I'm so privileged to be here because you two are my heroes. Oh, oh. No. <laughs> We think the same of you. <laughs> Obi John. Obi John. <laughs> Thanks for being here, John. So John reminded us today that the work of discernment is about asking the question, what would God have us do? Not what do we want to do or what do we think is best, but what would God have us do? And I think that that question begins to help us open the doors and open our eyes to see where God is leading us and calling us and pushing us. And if we choose to have courage and walk through those doors, I think it's there that we'll find wisdom. 
John referenced the Psalms as one of the rawest places where he believes wisdom is found in Scripture. And so we wanted to leave you today with Psalm 121 that encourages us to open our eyes. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Thank you so much for tuning in to More Than Sunday. We've got a new episode coming out every Wednesday, so make sure to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or YouTube so you don't miss our next episode. If you want to find out more about the Access community here at First United Methodist Church Richardson, you can find us online at accessfumcr.com, as well as on Facebook and Instagram. Special thanks to John Thornburg for joining us this week, and be sure and tune in next week as we have a conversation with Kim Kasten as we enter a new sermon series called Labels and talk to her about the gifts and consequences of our words. Have a great week. Music